In August 1989, Detective Les Zola was called to the murder of a millionaire couple in Beverly Hills. Within a few weeks of the killings, he discovered the true horror of the crime. The victims had been murdered by their own sons. Intense media interest in the murders would leave Zola fighting to keep a step ahead of journalists' own investigations. Proving the brothers' guilt would take seven years and destroy his own family life. Eric and Lal Menendez were the young sons of a wealthy movie executive. On August 20th, 1989, they brutally murdered their mother and father. They thought they had committed the perfect murder. This is a recording of Lyle Menendez, around an hour and a half after the murders. Beverly Hills Emergency? What's the problem? What's the problem? Pardon me? What? Who? Are they still there? The person who shot, they were shot? We have a hysterical person on the phone. 317-4257. Your Roman who was shot? I have listed for 722 Elm Drive. You need to remain calm. 722 Elm Drive. Priority call. All units respond to 722 Elm Drive. We have a possible we double homicide. Much possible. Yeah. 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 On the other side of L.A., Detective Les Zola received a call which would be the start of the most difficult and shocking case of his career. It was my boss, Sergeant Tom Edmonds. He said, we just had a double murder. It was a husband and wife in the uh, hills of Beverly Hills, and they were shotgunned to death. Come on in. I told him, but I'm still on vacation. He said, no, you're not. Come in. When I get a call like that, my mind immediately starts racing. I try to start figuring out what happened from the very onset of the phone call. So in this case, although I didn't have much information, I, I did have the knowledge that it was a husband and wife killed in their home. And I just tried to figure out, well, was it a burglary? You know, was it somebody they knew? Uh, you know, my mind is always trying to get a head start. Hey, Tom. It's pretty bad in here. Saranaki and Butkus were the first on the scene. They know about as much of it as I do. I've got the lab techs inside, but I told them to hold off till you got here. I think you want to take a look at it first. First of all, on a crime scene, as far as a murder crime scene, when you go into the house, it's an eerie silence to it. And I always feel that when I go into a murder crime scene. You know, I can recall just having this dryness about my, my throat, so I, I, it makes me swallow hard. And I immediately saw television, a big screen television on to my left. I walked forward into the room and saw Jose Menendez. His uh, head was slumped to one side. And I surveyed what I could immediately. And there was blood on the walls. There was uh, brain matter on the ceiling 
having so many gunshot wounds to each of them, as I said, it was an overkill. So it was somebody that, that had a great deal of hatred or, you know, just kept shooting and shooting and shooting, almost like in a frenzy for some reason. And, you know, I just had to figure out what that reason was. Kitty was laying on the floor on, one, on her right side. It was a little strange because her eyes were open and, you know, one eye was not damaged at all by the shotgun blast. And you almost had to think because of her location on the floor that she was trying to get away and that she actually saw who was murdering her. While Zola began his investigations at the crime scene, Sergeant Tom Edmonds was interviewing Eric and Lyle Menendez Lyle. in Beverly Hills Police Headquarters. We want to get the people responsible for Initially, your death basically that night, possible. they were witnesses. You think very carefully. Do you have any idea who might be behind this? I believe he died because I believe it was organized crime. And he died because he was. Lyle Menendez told time. Edmonds that he thought the mafia might be responsible for his I know father's this is death. It's going to be very difficult for you. I need you to talk me through everything that happened tonight. And we went out about eight to go to the movies. The brothers said that they hey, went to the movies and gone home and in the event the that they drink. wanted to get something to drink okay. because Eric had a fake ID at home. And that's when they Mom? entered, saw the lights on in the family room. Dad? The television on, assumed that the parents were still awake, went in and discovered the bodies. was much more upset and sobbing where Lyle was composed and able to answer questions. Initially, we certainly weren't going to think that they were suspects in any manner. We were treating them as a grieving family, the grieving sons, and as witnesses. And especially, we were cognizant that they were the ones that found their parents. And I'm sure that they were you know, having some problems with that psychologically. Because there was no physical evidence around, except for the bodies themselves, and of course any shotgun pellets that were inside the bodies. So somebody methodically looked through the crime scene to locate and remove any evidence, being the shotgun shell. the approximate time of death was? It immediately made me feel it was some type of a hit or something planned that somebody knew that they would get caught had we had this extra evidence. I mean, your mind is just racing to figure out what is going on here. The whole night was spent investigating this crime scene. The coroner, after a couple hours, left with the bodies of Jose and Kitty. And about 8.30 in the morning, another officer came yep. to us Lyle and said and that Menendez are out front. Lyle was there want to come inside. and wanted to pick up they some pick things up some for the day. Lyle was the spokesman for the two. He seemed very much in control. He was not outwardly distressed or upset. And of course, I realize that everybody treats different things in their life differently. And Lyle said that he wanted to pick up some stuff because he was staying at his tennis coach's house. And I said, well, what is it that you want to pick up? You want to pick up some clothes? It's not tennis equipment. Well, I want to pick up my tennis equipment. I can't do that for you today. OK, I'll come back. It just struck me as, you know, these guys don't seem right. They're not grieving properly for the death of their parents. And it made me think, you know, what's up with these guys? At the LA Times, John Johnson was given the story and told to start his own investigation. So it had all the elements for a great story right from the very beginning. Crime, not only because it happened in Beverly Hills, which 
sees about one murder every couple of years usually. A family, well, at least the parents were killed, and that's a very unusual thing, you know, even in some poorer communities. So that naturally made it leap out to anybody on the, on the news desk. But even in the first 24 hours of the investigation, Beverly Hills police were hearing a very different story about Jose. It seemed like everybody we talked to that was under Jose Menendez thought that he was a pretty tough boss. He, uh, he was, uh, well, you could say that he was hated as a boss. A lot of people didn't like him and thought that he was uh, pretty much a son of a bitch. And, you know, there was a lot of people that uh, weren't sorry to see him go. Beverly Hills, please. Yeah, hi, my friend Lyle. Who? Donovan Goodrow. Uh, I just wanted to get a message. Donovan who? Donovan Goodrow. Uh, I, I just wanted to, you know, pass my condolences. Yeah. Yeah, I'll give it to Lyle and Eric. Hey, Les. You want to know where we're at with Jose Menendez? Yeah, let's hear it. Jose Menendez, 44 years old, recently appointed president of Live International Video Entertainment. Officers quickly learned that Jose had upset one man in particular, the former owner of Live Entertainment, Noel Bloom, who was involved with the porn industry and rumored to have strong mafia ties. There was, of course, the angle of it possibly being mafia-oriented because of the uh, porno business. I mean, there's a lot of angles that we had to look at. Four days after the murders, Lyle and Eric Menendez arranged a memorial service for their parents at the Directors Guild of America on Sunset Boulevard. Zola and his partner went along to see if there were any strange faces or suspects among the mourners. But once again, it would be the brothers who would catch Zola's eye. The memorial service was set, I believe, for 11 o'clock. Eric and Lyle were probably an hour late. They didn't care about anybody but themselves. They just arrived when they wanted to arrive. When they finally entered the memorial service, they didn't look like they were grieving at all. It was just a, almost like a show for them. They were there, they were the center of attention. They just waltzed in. Now it can proceed because we are here. I mean, that was their demeanor almost throughout the whole investigation. It just doesn't seem like they were grieving like two sons who not only lost their parents to murder, but actually discovered their parents that were murdered. Every time that we had any dealings with Eric and Lyle, it always put a big question mark in my mind. You know, are they actually responsible? Zola's inquiries into the possibility of a mob killing had led nowhere. And although the brother's behavior was making him more and more suspicious, he'd been unable to uncover any possible motive for such vicious murders. It seemed like, you know, the family was close-knit. Kitty was helping with the schoolwork and running them from this practice to that practice and this game to that game. And, you know, Jose was there for, the, for them at night and the weekends, and, you know, he'd ask them how their day was. It seemed like a very normal family. There were no signs of any bitter arguments between Eric and Lyle and their parents, but Zola discovered that the brothers had been given free reign as children and become rowdy teenagers. They'd been in trouble at high school and had even been involved in a string of burglaries. Uh, one thing in particular I found out, they had burglarized friends of Eric's from high school. Soon Zola learned that Eric and Lyle had arrived late at the memorial service because they'd been to buy Rolex watches and money clips. In fact, Eric and Lyle have been spending hundreds of thousands of dollars from Jose's personal life insurance policy. Lyle bought a new $64,000 Porsche. Both brothers rented luxury apartments in Marina del Rey. Listen, I want to see if maybe we could meet this afternoon. And Lyle was also busy trying to establish himself as a young entrepreneur, buying a chain of restaurants in Princeton. Soon, John Johnson and Ron Sobel, the reporters from the LA Times, would share Zola's suspicions. It's one of the first things we'd actually tried to do, to sit them down and talk to them. I mean, it's a standard newspaper feature story. How are they doing after their parents were murdered? Hi, Johnson and Sobel, LA Times. 
the first thing is that they met us at the door and, and Lyle was very much in his new mode as a family mogul, very officious, but polite, welcoming and playing the young businessman. But I asked the question, how are you doing? I mean, trying to elicit some feelings about, you know, it's really hard for us to get on with our lives, you know, our parents meant everything to us, that kind of a response. Instead, Lyle um, sort of leaned back in the chair and he says, well, it's been quite a while since the murders happened now, and this is, you know, a few weeks and uh, we're pretty much over it and ready to move on with our lives. That shocked me. What? They did it. The reporters had asked for names and numbers of some of their friends for the article. A call to one friend of Lyle's, Glenn Stevens, would put Johnson ahead of the police and give him the big story he was waiting for. I was asking him some general questions, and he almost volunteered. He said, well, you know, I don't know who could have done it, but part of me thinks that uh, Lyle might have even done it. He also told me about, uh, you know, a computer in the house that had a new will being written on it. And uh, he said that, uh, if I remember right, that Lyle was concerned about this. The L.A. Times is running a story almost daily on the murder. Hey, Les, I got John Johnson from the Times online too. I'll take it in my office. He said that he had learned that Zola. Lyle had hired somebody to look at the family computer. He was concerned that he was being disinherited. Any luck? Well, the files are still there, but uh, looks like uh, they might have been copied over by mistake. We could still get them open, but it it could take some Tried time. Tried to open the files and said, I can't open the files either. Lucky. That looks like they've been written over. So Lyle evaluated okay, that right. and said, well. I don't have to have the data. I just want to find it and get it off. What I want you to do is I want you to erase everything so that nobody can gain any information from it. In fact, why don't you erase everything and make it look like you weren't even here, that you weren't even able you know to what? do anything. You know, I don't want any trace that the files were even there. You know, at times it seemed like we were out manned and, and out financed by the LA Times. John Johnson had called, in essence, to tell us that they're running the story the following day. I thought it was a good opportunity to go up and put a little pressure on Eric and Lyle. This was October 31st, 10 weeks after the murders. Yes. Hi, it's Les Zoller from the Beverly Hills Police Department. I went up to the house and lo and behold, Eric was home. Lyle wasn't, he was on the East Coast. Can I Coast. come in? Can I offer you anything, Mr. Zoller? So I proceeded to tell Eric that the LA Times is going to write an article about the computer. I'm gonna be straight with you, Eric. The Times are writing an article that indicates you, especially Lyle, are suspects. And I told Eric that I, but I was beginning to have doubts about Lyle. To erase some of the files dealing with your mom and dad's will. So the focus is on Lyle. We don't know if you were involved in any yet or not. You know, I finally asked Eric, I said, do you think that Lyle's involved in this? You think Lyle hired someone to kill your parents? No. And he looked and he said, well, I don't think so. I don't think he's involved in this. It wasn't but an emphatic sure no. It was help. almost where he had he doubt. Will. He'll be happy to talk to you when he gets back from the East Coast. Um, have him give you a call. You be sure and do that. I hate to think he's keeping anything from us. <laughs> After I spoke to Eric, as it turns out, I found out later, Eric fell apart. He couldn't live with himself for what he had done. Hello, can I, can I speak to Lyle, please? It's his brother. Then where did he go? No, no message. He contacted the psychologist that he had had previously for these burglaries and said that he needed to talk to him immediately. The psychologist, who was Jerry Ozeal, said, you know, what's this in reference to? And he said, well, it's in reference to 
the way I'm feeling about the death of my parents. Yes, doc Dr. Ozeal, please. And Jerry Ozeal cleared a schedule and said, okay, I can see you this day. Judelon Smith, Dr. Ozeal's lover and a former patient, had arranged to meet the psychologist at his consulting rooms. The conversation she would overhear that night would be repeated again and again in court and become critical in proving the brother's uh, guilt. What's up? Uh, I'm sorry, Jerry. Uh, sorry, I... Uh, just... oh, come on in. Come on in. Now sit down. Eric had a conscience. Something? Eric went to Ozeal because he couldn't live with what he had done. Once he realized what he had done and the complexity of it, what is it uh, you wanted to speak to me about? It preyed on his mind and his psyche, and he couldn't live with himself. I uh, right, just take a, take a deep breath, relax. It's just you and I. Okay. I've been having all of these suicidal thoughts recently. Jerry Ozeal spoke to him, and. Eric told him everything, that he and Lyle had committed these murders. He did it. We killed our parents. Lyle and I killed my mom and dad. Zola would only hear about Eric's confession five months later. But on the 31st of October, Eric told his psychologist about the murders. Anxious to cover his back, Dr. Ozeal asked his girlfriend, Judelon Smith, to listen into his conversation from the adjoining office. I want you to call Lyle. Because we need to get him down here. Dr. Ozeal convinced Eric to call Lyle and have Lyle come in so that Jerry could evaluate his demeanor and to see whether anybody, especially Eric, was in danger. So Eric called. Lyle? And told Lyle that he was with Jerry Ozeal and that he, he had explained what they had done. I'm here with Dr. Ozeal. What's going on? I told him what we did. Eric, stay there, okay? Don't go anywhere and don't let Ozeal go anywhere, you hear me? Do not say another word about what happened until I get there, you got it? Okay. If something's come up, I'll give you guys a call later. Well, well, I thought it was a good idea they brought the, brought the guns out of town. Judelon Smith heard Eric say that the brothers had bought the shotguns from a store in San Diego. But it would be her account of the next few minutes which would prove crucial to the case against Eric and Lyle. Lyle. So the first thing that Lyle did, I mean, he was extremely upset, and he said, I can't believe you did this. I can't believe that you did this, my brother. In fact, I don't even have a brother. It's like I don't even have a brother. He says, now you know what we're going to have to do, do to Jerry Ozeal. He says, we're going to have to get rid of him. We're going to have to do to Dr. Ozeal exactly what we did to Mom and Dad and anyone associated with him. All right, now, now let's wait a minute here. Let's just all calm down, okay? Eric got so Lyle, upset with Lyle sit down. confronting him with this and yelling at him. I don't want any part of it. And he just left in tears. Jerry followed Lyle to the elevator. Lyle, Lyle, wait, please. Listen, Listen. I can kind of understand Eric, but he just shouldn't have done this. Now we're going to have to take care of it, okay? So oh, he Lyle, looked please. at him and he let's, says, let's, is that a threat? Am I to take this as a threat? Good luck, Doctor. No, Lyle, wait, wait. Lyle, wait. Be Eric. 
Come on, get in the car. Let's get out of here. Okay, go on. Come on. Oh, here. I keep going here. like this. Oh. Listen to me. You gotta pull yourself together. We're both going to San Quentin. Do you understand that? Huh? Let's go. Get in the car. Give me this. Lyle, wait. Listen. Let's go upstairs and talk about this, please. Lyle, I'm not gonna tell anyone about this. I can't. Patient privilege. It's the law. Please. Lyle! Two weeks after Zola's meeting in the Menendez home, Craig Signorelli, a close friend of Eric's, called up and asked to meet with Zola. Up to that point, Signorelli had been reluctant to talk to detectives, and Zola had assumed he was trying to protect his friend. Craig! Hey! He said, well, I have something to say. I said, well, just say it. And he proceeded to say that Shortly after the murders, he had gotten together with Eric at the house in Beverly Hills, and Eric said, do you want to know what happened? So, you, you want to know how it happened? And he said, well, sure. So Eric actually walked him through the crime scene. That night, uh, Lyle and I come back to get my fake ID so we could go out and get a couple of drinks. Hey, Mom, we're heading over to Paris to go get a few Erica drinks. Erica told Signorelli okay? that he and Lyle had come back to pick up his fake ID and that he'd walk back to the car to find Lyle waiting with the shotguns. But it would later emerge that Eric and Lyle had both planned to commit the murders that night. It was the maid's night off, and Jose and Kitty would typically fall asleep in front of a movie on Sunday evening. Sick of their demanding father, they wanted a divorce from their parents without the financial penalties. Tension between Jose and the brothers had risen steadily over the summer. Lyle was about to be expelled from Princeton for poor academic performance and bad behavior. And Jose disapproved of Eric's friends and lifestyle. Once again, their father was making noises about disinheriting them both. The brothers had rationalized that if they killed Jose, they would have to kill their mother too. This would ensure there was no one to suspect them and no one in the way of their inheritance. After collecting the empty shotgun shells from around their parents' bodies, they drove down Mulholland Drive, a long, steep road that runs from the Hollywood Hills down to the ocean. Do it. The brothers had carefully planned an alibi. After disposing of the shotguns, they were due to meet a friend for some drinks at the Cheesecake Factory. Eric, you're gonna have to pull it together by the time we get to Perry's. I can't. I can't see you. What do you mean you can't? That's the plan, Eric. We've already made arrangements. I know. But Eric was too overcome by emotion, and instead, they returned home. And we're gonna have to go home. <laughs> and call 911. Hey, it could have happened, huh? After it was over, Eric said, it could have happened. And I said, well, why didn't you tell this earlier? And he says, because of Eric's statement, it could have happened. I wasn't sure that it did it happen. Happened? And I said, well, what do you mean you yeah. weren't sure? He said, well, Eric and I Meaning wrote plays happened. all the time. We wrote the perfect burglary, the perfect robbery, the perfect murder. And he says, I didn't know whether he was just saying that as he was 
thinking that that would have been the perfect murder of his parents. So, and my first thought in hearing this is that we've got him. You know, we've got enough information now, enough evidence to look, arrest him. Look, and I remember here. thinking about it now and then calling the DA who we've been talking to, Pam Ferraro. But Zola would be disappointed. Hi, Pam. Pam Ferraro yeah. felt Eric's statement, so it could have happened, meant his story didn't quite so amount to a confession. I need to pick your brain about Craig Singer. Les Soler and his partner were under a great deal of pressure to, you know, arrest someone and, and get this yeah, case closed. And during the course of the investigation, the detectives kept coming to me and saying, is this enough? And I kept saying, no. You need one piece of great physical evidence because we know they did it, but we only get one shot at prosecuting them. Why don't you get Signorelli to wear a wire? I caught him talking to Eric about it. We got the idea to wire Craig and meet yeah. with Eric and see whether we can get the same statement by Eric. That's true. Now we had to approach Craig with that idea. I was particularly concerned because they were such good friends. I gave Craig a call and I told him what we needed and why we needed it. And to my surprise, he agreed to it. We arranged to meet Craig, and we met him a couple of miles away from the restaurant, up above the beach, so that we could uh, instruct him and put the wire on him. We had a backup wire in, in the event that one didn't work. Okay, you put your checks in this, and you put this between you and him during the meal. Okay. When they were both in the restaurant, we knew that that was the time that most likely the subject would be broached. And it seemed like whenever the conversation came to anything, the noise was higher because of the people talking and the dishes clattering. It was just noises. We had a hard time listening. Is this the best sound we can get? Yeah, that's all we got. Craig actually told Eric that the police had been after him, thinking that he was a suspect. And that kind of set the tone where Craig could actually no, asked seriously. Eric, you know, did you totally murder your parents in a anything. joking way? Well, did you kill your parents? No, I did not. And Eric said, no. Once I heard the denial, I thought, well, we didn't get the statement that we wanted on tape. And we were, in essence, right where we were before Craig told us anything. I didn't think it was any good at all. The problem we had with this investigation is we needed evidence. We had none. If the brothers were suspects in this, we couldn't even use fingerprints at the crime scene because they lived there. So in essence, we needed a confession, and then a confession is only as good as the statement itself, and if we can prove it. When I was investigating Menendez's case, I lived about 42 miles from Beverly Hills, so I spent a lot of time on the road and my mind would just start drifting about what I was going to do with the case. And it would always go back to that scene, the night that I met Jose and Kitty Menendez, that stillness in the room. I saw Jose, I saw Jose many times in my mind, just slumped to his right. And his head was kind of off-centered because the shotgun blasted, had distorted it so badly. And there was blood everywhere. I don't know what it was, but that's my my worst memory of the case is that crime scene when I first walked in and I just realized that these two people had been savagely murdered. As weeks turned into months, Zola and the DAs began to worry. Jose Menendez's estate was about to be released from probate and Eric and Lyle would end up with his fortune. It wasn't until March 5th of the following year that Zola finally got his break. Judelon Smith, the woman who overheard Eric's confession to his psychologist, was now Dr. Ozeal's ex-patient and ex-girlfriend. She approached an attorney for advice on taking legal action against Ozeal. I got a phone call from the district attorney in Beverly Hills. And he explained that through a friend of his, a Judelon Smith had called and wanted to complain about Jerry Ozeal. And in complaining about John, Jerry Ozeal, um, she had mentioned the Menendez brothers. Can we give me that number of that, that attorney that you know? I wasn't sure whether I could 
call Judalon Smith as a detective and have her speak to me. So I decided to have this mutual friend of the district attorney in Judalon introduce me as a friend of his. Hello, Judalon. Hope you don't mind, but I brought a friend with me. Les Zoller, Judalon Smith. Hello. Why don't you come on in? Her main concern was to make sure that Jerry Ozeal paid for what he had done to her. I think um, Jerry's telling me a lot of things he wants me to believe and say. I mean, he's very manipulative. And in speaking about Jerry Ozeal, she just kind of threw in her lap that, uh, oh, by the way. I mean, I know for a fact I don't need this much medication. The uh, Menendez brothers killed their parents. And the Menendez brothers, they definitely murdered their parents. I was there when one of the brothers came in and told Jerry all about it. And the other one came in and he was very angry. Will you excuse me for a moment? And I told this acquaintance, I said, you know, I've got to tell her that I'm a detective so that she can realize that I'm going to be using the information that she's giving us. I explained that I had knowledge of the Menendez case. Well, in actuality, I'm a detective for the Beverly Hills Police Department. I need to explain who I am. That's okay, officer. I, uh, I guess to you or... And it was like, no big deal. Okay. And then she continued anyway, with her story. Uh, Jerry's got himself caught up in She really told Zola that Ozeal yeah, continued to see the brothers for counseling, telling them that he'd help them understand why they killed their parents. Judalon said Ozeal had taped these sessions. So by six the next morning, Zoller and the DA had search warrants for Ozeal's home. And Jerry Ozeal's wife came the to the hell? door. I'm Elliot Aldehoff of the LA County District Attorney's Office. We have a warrant to search your home. What? We have a warrant to search your house. We had to recover some audio tapes belonging to your husband. And she was cooperative, but said, Do you mind if I get dressed first? Can I go get some clothes sure. on? I'll be right back. And Elliot said, yes. And I looked at Elliot and I said, Elliot, mind if I go burn some tape? She's in there destroying our evidence. And Elliot looked and he goes, Damn. Damn. And then he's banging on the door. Get the door. We didn't find the tapes. She didn't destroy anything. And told us that uh, what we were looking for were in a safety deposit box in a bank nearby. So we responded to the bank and obtained the tapes. Zola and Alhadef quickly listened to some of the recordings. After a few minutes, it became obvious that the tape conversations between the brothers and Ozeal were enough for the DA to get an arrest warrant. We got it. Okay, guys, there was a go. risk that the laws protecting patient therapist confidentiality would prevent the tapes being used against the brothers in court. But the DAs hoped the threats Lyle made to Dr. Ozeal would erase that confidentiality barrier. With a confession on tape, Zoller expected two easy convictions. On March 8th, officers took up positions on Elm Drive, outside the Menendez Mansion. So we're going to Cheesecake Factory? Unless you have a better idea. Sounds good Eric to me. was apparently out of the country, but a surveillance team had spotted Lyle at the family home. You're moving. There were rumors that Eric would flee Israel and go on the run. But within 24 hours, he landed at Los Angeles International Airport, where Zola was waiting for him. You could just feel that he had a relief upon him. Eric had a hard time with what he had done, which is why he went to Dr. Ozil to begin with. But it seemed like almost a relief that he had finally been caught for what he had done. 
Even with Eric and Lyle in custody, Zola's job was far from over. He still needed some physical evidence to strengthen the case against the brothers. Our next step is to find the gun store where the guns were purchased down in San Diego. Sergeant Edmonds and I drove down to San Diego and spent the whole day looking through gun store gun records. The last gun store was a big five going through the records and all of a sudden I looked and there was gun purchases by a Donovan Goodrow. Donovan who? And I remembered that name, Donovan Goodrow, as a friend of Lyle's. Looking at that name and I purchased those shotguns, it, I just, I felt like jumping for joy. Eric and Lyle were arraigned within 48 hours. They were smartly dressed in black suits and seemed unruffled by the charges leveled against them. They pleaded not guilty to murder. The brothers would spend the next three years in prison, waiting for the case to come to court. In that time, the prosecution scored a major victory. A superior court judge ruled that because of Lyle's threats, Ozeal's tapes could be used as evidence. But the defense were also working hard with Eric and Lyle in those three years. When the legal battle finally began, the brothers seemed to have undergone a transformation. Their dress, manner, and plea had all changed. I began to realize that we had a really good case and that they were going to try to get out of it. And I actually told people, I think they're going to have to allege sexual abuse because that's the only thing I can think of that they can do to try to get out from under this. Based upon this evidence, it will become apparent that this murder was unlawful, unjustified, and wholly premeditated, and that it was accomplished through a conspiracy into which Lyle Menendez entered with his brother and that but for a few mistakes they made, this was almost the perfect murder. We made our opening statement and they immediately, the defense made theirs, which sometimes they do and sometimes they wait. It was spellbinding. You could hear a feather drop. Did you love your mom and dad? Yes. And on August 20th, 1989, did you and your brother kill your mother and father? Yes. Did you kill them for money? <coughs> No. no. Did you kill them because you wanted to pay them back for the way they had treated you? Um, no. It was like watching a really good high school production. Um, they had been in custody for a long, long time before we actually had the trial. And I am quite confident that they spent a lot of time practicing their lines. Uh, fondle me, and he would ask me to do the same with him, and I would, I would touch him, and we would undress. They did a fairly good job, and I was told by the bailiffs that after court, they'd go back and they'd high-five each other because they'd done such a good job, you know, with their riveting testimony about sexual abuse. <sighs> to watch them get up on the stand and be so emotional in front of this jury, it was really unbelievable because I had seen their emotion the day of the murder and every other time that I had dealt with them, and they never showed any of this emotion. So, of course, it was a big act for them, and I could see that it was an act. The case had a, a constant toll on me. It uh, became an emotional heartache for me. I would go home and be stressed out, or I would go home and be upset with this case, and, of course, I couldn't be upset with anybody I was working with, so where did that anger and stress go? It went home. Eventually, it took its toll, and it caused my wife and I to separate and then divorce. In his second day on the witness stand, Eric Menendez described how he burst into the room where his parents were watching television and blindly opened fire. I was just firing as I went into the room. I just started firing. In what direction? In front of me. What was in front of you? My parents. But the bulk of Menendez's testimony and yesterday was devoted to a detailed and emotional account of sexual abuse by his father. Abuse, Eric said, lasted from when he was six years old. Menendez said when he was 11, his father violently raped him for the first time. It was a performance. And looking at the jury, you could see them almost crying with them. They could see the emotion. They could feel the emotion that uh, the brothers were portraying on the stand. And it was all just a lie. You know, I never uncovered any of this abuse. It was mental abuse. It was never physical abuse or sexual abuse. By their father, as she argued that the brothers... 
the jury was out for the better part of two weeks. And within that two weeks, I can't concentrate on anything. This is what I've been working on for the past so many years. The longer they're out, the more I think that it's going to be a not guilty. At last, the judge recalled the court, but there was no verdict. The jury and the alternate are now in the courtroom. Do any of the jurors feel there is any reasonable probability of reaching a unanimous decision? Is that all 12 of you agree? I find that the jury is hopelessly deadlocked. The and, jury could uh, not agree, the and the judge decided. ordered a retrial. In this matter. Once I saw that smirk yeah, on Lyle's face, you know, it, it went right in line with everything I knew case. about Lyle. You know, he was just a cocky, cold-blooded murderer. The retrial gave the prosecution a chance to sharpen up their case. Well, in the second trial, because we didn't do that the first time, we figured that, well, any testimony that's given that you don't dispute it must be truth. So we decided that we're going to dispute everything they put on. We put our own experts on to say that they were not traumatized and it was not in self-defense. And it seemed to go a lot quicker. We actually concentrated on the crime scene a lot more. Because it was to a good end, the jury uh, came back with a guilty. Uh, I remember just exhaling forever. It was just over. I didn't have to go through it again. On July 2nd, 1996, Eric and Lyle were sentenced to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. They're now serving their sentences in separate California jails. It was seven years out of my life, from the time of the murder till the time it was complete in court. That's all I thought about for the majority of that seven years was the Menendez brothers and the Menendez murders. When the case was finally over, I realized that I had lost a marriage, lost a family. My whole life had changed because of this case. I know that because of the time that I spent on the Menendez case, I didn't spend with my children. To this day, my children are distant from me, which I attribute to the Menendez case.